Hi, I'm Larry Warren. You know, when you listen to different lecturers about SIBO, you hear so many of them talking about adhesions and that adhesions are, can be a real problem for people with SIBO. And um, really they're talking about physical medicine and how, how would one get rid of adhesions? And what do adhesions even have to do with SIBO and with the persistence of SIBO and with getting rid of SIBO? So am I a candidate for something having to do with adhesions? Do I even have adhesions? So I thought I'd kind of take you through this because uh, really the way we as providers discovered that adhesions were a significant problem in persistent SIBO, that is SIBO that seemed to respond some to pharmaceuticals or nutraceutical antibiotics but then would come right back. The way that that happened was really a beautiful thing, and, and it's really how medicine should, should occur. Um, what happened was, I was, we were treating patients with blocked fallopian tubes and bowel obstructions, that is to say, adhesions, these internal bonds like straitjackets that form whenever we heal and remain after we heal from a surgery or infection or inflammation. So we were treating th these and people that were really coming to us from around the world. And um, the patient said to me, you know, Dr. Dr. Seebecker really wants to talk with you. And I said, who? Dr. Seebecker. Well, I didn't know a Dr. Seebecker. And w when we're treating, we get into sort of this right brain intuitive where we're listening and following and really being the instrument and the audience and sort of treatment is going through it. So, so I, I just did not recall her name and didn't make a note afterwards. About four to six weeks later, another patient says, well, Dr. Sandberg Lewis really wants to talk to you. And I didn't connect the dots at all. I didn't have any reason to connect the dots. And the same thing happened. I kind of thought, well, that's that's nice. And, and but I'm, I'm busy treating my patients and trying to give them their lives back. Um, and then uh, finally, I, th I think it was uh, Stephen Sandberg Lewis who, who called me in and said, y you know, uh, Mr. Werner, I wanted to introduce myself and I wanted to thank you for helping our patients with SIBO. And I said, what are you talking about? And, and he said, well, you treated this patient with SIBO, she came to one of your clinics, one of your locations, and she, when she came, she was a, in her mid-30s, but she was down to like 86 pounds. She was in a wheelchair, she was so weak. The bacteria were eating her food. And I said, really? And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said, you know, and, and her doctor, Dr. Gervich, would would prescribe antibiotics or nutraceutical or pharmaceutical, and they would seem to work for a few days, but then the SIBO would come right back, and, and once you treated her, the, the medications worked, and she's regained all of, all of her weight now. She's up to 128 pounds, something in that area. Um, the, so I just wanted to thank you and, and kind of ask why this is happening, and, and I said, well, I'm really glad we helped, but what is SIBO? <laughs> and he laughed and he said, oh, oh, you don't know what SIBO is. And I said, no, no, but I'm really glad we helped your patient. Um, so he explained to me about small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and uh, overgrowth or the prevalence of the type of bacteria that should remain in your large intestines that somehow either matriculates up into your small intestines or is ingested in food um, from you know, food poisoning is often a cause of it. Um, he, so, so, so Dr. Sandberg Lewis said, you know what, I, I, I need to come to Florida and see you and talk with you about this because this is really important. Well, 
he did come to Florida and he came to our headquarters in Gainesville, Florida, where the University of Florida is. We have a large medical school. We can tap on some of the PhDs, biostatisticians there, when, because we believe in publishing studies. Uh, we believe in looking people in the eye and saying this is what we can do and we know we can do it because um, we've had biostatisticians and PhDs and independent physicians compile our data and look at it and, and say this is, this is what your results are. So, so, so Stephen came, Dr. Sandberg Lewis came and um, very, very bright man, very intelligent. I had, I arranged to have some people much brighter than I. I had our double PhD, a woman whose PhDs are in uh, disease modeling, that is to say, where do diseases originate? How do they grow in the body? Dr. Rice is someone that, um, she did our studies, but then every once in a while the government, the U.S. government would haul her away, dress her in a white hazmat outfit to go to some part of the world where there was cholera or anthrax or uh, Ebola, some infectious disease to, to help those people and the U.S. government helping those people to, to get out of their, um, their problems. So, so she was an expert in what happens at that small cellular level uh, where diseases occur, where they start, and how do they grow. So I had Dr. Sandberg Lewis with her, and then I brought in the chief of staff of, of a fairly large regional hospital, a gentleman who followed us for 20 years. He eventually left the hospital and stayed with us. He never charged me a dime. He said, I'm just so fascinated with what you're doing. You're replacing surgery for so many of my patients and so many other patients. Um, this is um, Nobel Prize stuff. Um, so Dr. Um, Dr. Um, King, Richard King, and Amanda Rice, Dr. Rice, and Dr. Sandberg Lewis, I gathered them in the room with me to ask what is going on here for Dr. Sandberg Lewis to explain in depth the processes that he sees occurring with SIBO for Dr. Rice to start understanding how that grows, how they proliferate in the body uh, for Dr. King as a surgeon and researcher, uh, the physician of, of 35 years at that time um, and me, that was the small intellect in the room, um, to find out why did we save this woman's life and can we help other people with SIBO? This is, what we determined is this, that we knew that SIBO is this occurrence of a lar large proliferation of, of bacteria in the small intestines that should not be there and that bacteria can do damage in numerous ways. In, in the case of our patient, they were eating her food. What we are experts at, we're mechanics, we're good at, at decreasing adhesions, at pulling apart these adhesive crosslinks. They're like the run in a sweater, but in a th the three-dimensional sweater of your body. In the intestines, they can kink the intestines like a garden hose. They can create a stricture, which is a narrowing. It can be a pencil-like, or it can be an hourglass-type stricture. Um, they, can, they can form, I guess, inside of the... They can form inside the intestines as well. In any event, when they do form at the intestines, they can slow or even stop the passage of food or anything through the intestines. So in the case of small bowel obstruction, which we were treating and are treating and are publishing quite a bit on, um, this can become a life-threatening condition. If you can't get food through your gut, you're gonna die. In 100% of the cases, you absolutely have to have nutrition going through there. In the case of this patient who was responding to the medications, but then the SIBO would come right back, we all determined that what was happening was 
Yeah, the SIBO, the medications were knocking down the SIBO, really killing off so much of it. But then because of adhesions in the bowel due to prior surgery or infection or inflammation, due to adhesions in the bowel, there were maybe a few bacteria left and they would just reproliferate. That is to say, the bacteria could not be flushed out of this woman's system. They stayed there and regrew, and that was the problem. That when we treated and we cleared those adhesions so that the intestines were clear and food and bacteria could, treated bacteria could pass through that those bacteria were flushed out of her system. And the uh, proof was in this case that, that the medications worked. She regained all of her weight. She's not in a wheelchair anymore. She's leading a, a normal life. And um, so how did this occur? We'll look a little bit at how it occurred and, and our adventure in, in learning about adhesions. We'll look at Where's the proof? Do we have further proof? And we do. Uh, we've published a few, quite a few studies uh, with before and after films and such like that. And does this apply to me? That is to say to you as a patient. And if so, what do I need to do about it? So first perhaps is to get a good concept of what adhesions are and why they form and how they form and then perhaps what one does to get rid of them if one has adhesions. So if you are, let's just use an analogy for a moment. Let's just create a, a little scene. Imagine, think back to when you were nine or 10 years old, if you're older than that now, and you're running, you're playing a running game with friends and they're chasing you and you're laughing because you're faster than they are. and and. Uh, maybe you're playing tag. Um, so you cut off through this field and um, while you're running, somebody off to your right behind you calls your name. And while you're running, you look back to see who's calling you and bam, you don't see a stick. You trip over it and whack. You land on your left hip and you give it a pretty good whack when you land. The first thing that happens when you receive a trauma like that or you have a surgery, or you have an infection, or inflammation, including SIBO is, causes inflammation itself, and we'll talk more about that. But in this case, a fall onto that left hip, the first thing that happens is these tiny strands of collagen, they are like the strands of a nylon rope. They're very strong. They've been estimated at around 2,000 pounds a square inch. They're tiny, but they come rushing in and start laying down on top of each other in a chaotic pattern, in a random pattern, to help stop the bleeding, to act as a patch, to isolate the area that's been injured, to, to stop any bacteria that may have gotten in if your skin was scratched, to stop any bacteria from going to other parts of your body. So they really form as the first step in the healing process. They're very strong. Um, so then your white blood cells and your immune system go to work. You continue healing. You, know, you might turn interesting colors at that hip for a few weeks even. A couple of months later, you're feeling pretty good. Three months after you fell, you really don't even notice that left hip anymore where you fell. And you're perfect. You've got your wonderful three-dimensional sweater back. Your body is, is strong and supple, mobile. Well, everywhere except in this one little place at your left hip, because the crosslinks, the little collagen strands, we call them crosslinks, that formed when you were first injured or had an infection, when those tissues, when you had tissue damage, the first strands that formed as the strands that formed as the first step in the healing process, if they have not dissipated and the first seven to 10 days, they're there with you for life, okay? So, well, as you might imagine, probably all of us have adhesions somewhere in our bodies. If, if they happen on our buns, we fell on our, we might not even notice that in, in 
some places, or we scratched our skin, we cut our finger, and you can see this scar tissue on the top, but it's not really affecting you that much. But when they happen in the delicate tissues of the abdomen and the intestines, they can really wreak havoc. They can squeeze the intestines shut, as I indicated earlier, like uh, kinking a garden hose or in a stricture, a narrowing, um, preventing food from going, slowing or preventing food from going through, stopping the migrating motil the, uh, motility, the uh, migrating motor complex. The, um, and, and they're there with you for life. They're, they're just not going away. So they will stay after the first 10 days, they'll tend to stay the same or to grow over time. So that if you have some adhesions that have formed, if you've had a C-section, if you've had an appendectomy, God knows if your abdomen, if your, or if your appendix burst and you had infection throughout your pelvis, any sort of injury in that area and adhesions form, then later in life you're reaching up to grab something and it pulls down here because it's so tight, causes some more inflammation, more crosslinks will go and, and to, let's go, oh my gosh, this body has is, is really got some inflammation. Now let's go start a, a healing process there. So they can tend to grow over time. In talking about adhesions and their relationship to SIBO, we're really talking about obstructions in the body. That is to say, adhesive obstructions in the body. How adhesions form inside or outside the loops of the bowel, squeeze it shut, um, slow the passage of food perhaps, but also slow the exit of treated bacteria from the body. So when we're talking about adhesions in the bowel that affect your response to medications that your physician has prescribed for the SIBO, we are really talking about bowel obstructions. That is to say, adhesions are obstructing either the passage of food or the passage of treated bacteria out of your body. So in a lot of the subsequent words that I'm going to be saying, you'll be hearing me talk about bowel obstructions. Please understand that I'm talking about adhesions inside or outside the loops of the bowel when I say bowel obstructions, I'm talking about exactly what that first group of Dr. Sandberg Lewis, Dr. Rice, Dr. King, and I discussed when we determined that adhesions are stopping the medications from working. So I'll be talking about bowel obstruction. Please understand, I do not do so in lieu of, or instead of talking about SIBO, I'm talking about how the intestines get obstructed and that affects SIBO. We have good data on treating bowel obstructions and before and after films and controlled studies now, um, a major one. It's, it's what we're treating with SIBO. It used to be in looking at our patient's history when we first started treating SIBO that we were looking really at, at does this, has this person had surgery? Um, has she had endometriosis? Because adhesions go with endometriosis kind of like salt goes with pepper. They're, they're so often together. Um, has she had a, a trauma in that area? And what we found was, and what we were surprised to find was, probably the most adhered abdomen I have maybe ever felt was in a woman who had never had any of those. No traumas, no surgeries, no endometriosis, but she had had SIBO for over 12 years. 
So the, it was our first indication that really the inflammation of the bacteria, the inflammation that they are causing in the bowel can cause truly massive adhesions in the gut. And when they do, they can, they can stop food from going through, slow food, and certainly stop treated bacteria from exiting the gut once your physician has prescribed a, a, a medication and put you on a medication. So now you have a pretty good idea and sense of whether or not you may have adhesions. Um, if you have a history of any injury, uh, certainly a surgery, most surgeries cause adhesions to form. No matter how brilliant, compassionate, and wonderful your surgeon is, and there are fabulous surgeons out there, they cannot help but cause adhesions to form because they form as the first step in healing. If you, the surgeon has to burn some areas or cut some areas, even cutting adhesions, new adhesions are going to form there. They can't, they can't help it. That's, that's the way the body heals. So um, if you have been prescribed medications before, the medications maybe responded for a little while, but then the SIBO came right back. So that's a pretty good indication. We can, incidentally, we'll be glad to help you figure out whether this may be the case for you. And we don't charge anything for that. We do, and we're not selling anything. If 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 we, we'll just tell you straight what's what what we think is going on and give you uh, quite a bit of education um, if you are interested in in following this up with us and seeing what uh, what's possibly going on for you. So what does one do about adhesions? Well, there, there are really two things that have been shown in scientific literature, and I'm talking about peer-reviewed studies in the National Library of Medicine, reviewed by physicians, by statisticians, and scientists, found worthy of publication with actual success rates and data showing um, how well they do. The, the two things that I know of that really address adhesions and have scientific backing are surgery and, and the work that we do. And, and uh, I'll kind of go through the science of that, but um, surgery, as we already looked at, causes more adhesions. So it, frequently a surgeon will say, I'll, I'll, I'll go in there if, if you need me to, but unless this is a life-threatening condition, you, I, I think you'd need to learn to live with the condition because if I go in there, I, I'm going to cause more adhesions. Um, <laughs> incidentally, one of your indicators of adhesion, it does not always occur, but it frequently does, is pain and unexplained pain. Because adhesions are made of collagen, and collagen covers literally every structural cell in the body, it is very difficult for a physician to diagnose adhesions without opening up and looking in and getting direct visualization of, of what's going on inside of there. So uh, frequently patients will, will hear from their physician, I don't see anything, or there's nothing there. Maybe it's all in your head. Just relax. Everybody has pain. Certainly all women have pain. Um, just um, maybe see a psychologist. They're not being unkind. Uh, they may be being inaccurate. In the case of the physician that says, I don't see anything, he or she is being very accurate because whether you have an X-ray, a CAT scan, an MRI, any diagnostic imaging, they do not show adhesions. Uh, there is a small bowel pass-through test where you, you will drink something, a liquid, it, it's about the consistency of a malted milk, but it has a, a, a radium tracer in it, 
uh, something that shows up on x-rays, and they can follow that through the bowel, and they can see, oh, wow, it stops here and it kind of bulges up above, um, there must be adhesions there. Some, they can't see the adhesions. They can only see the intestines, the bowel, and what's happening in the bowel. Gee, these are really narrowed here. And we'll look at some films in a couple of minutes uh, uh, that are quite fascinating um, this, uh, to, to give you information. Because really, for you to be your own physician, this is the best. Really, because as you've seen, there's confusion out there among physicians about SIBO. Does it even really exist? Oh, yes, it exists. How does it respond? What is, does it respond better to this food or that food? Um, what do we do about it? Um, so, so there's surgery. So a surgeon can go in there and um, cut or burn adhesions and it will generally buy you some time. If you're lucky, it does everything you need. Um, if you're unlucky or you have a lot of adhesions there, there's some major risks with surgery. There's the risk of inadvertent enterotomy, which is where a surgeon will inadvertently cut another organ or cut into your bowel by mistake. It's not that the surgeon is really a lousy surgeon, it's just, he or she is facing a wall of white of these adhesions and trying to get through that and to carve a place through that to help relieve you of these powerful bonds that can be like straitjackets or glue in the body. They can go, oops. If a little bit of your bowel contents is released by an inadvertent cut and you have 21 feet of small intestines, then suddenly this bacteria, this poo actually, is, even if it's just a couple of drops, it's free to spread in to grow and proliferate in an area that is warm, moist, dark. It is perfect for bacterial growth. So, for example, in patients that we treat with bowel obstruction, According to the U.S. government, if they've had a bowel obstruction surgery, Department of Health and Human Services determined that 18% of those return to the hospital within 30 days for another hospitalization, another, often another surgery, in which case now we've got major problems. We've got peritonitis. We've got infection spread throughout the gut. So now we need to go ahead and cut you open, open you up and, and in so many cases, and pour antibiotics into the area to help um, to, to, to kill that bacteria, which is now spread in these warm, moist, dark places between the loops of your bowel. Um, and then, in a lot of cases, let's just let that heal from the inside out, which causes even more and often massive scarring. So, um, there's some risk of anesthesia. They're studying this. It's generally for people that have been under uh, general anesthesia more than once is what they're looking at um, as, as far as possible brain damage. Uh, the jury is out on that, but it's, uh, it's the physicians are looking at this seriously. Um, so, so that's, well, but that's one thing you can do for, for adhesions. Um, and that's really the traditional medical model. If that is the standard of care, if, if, if you have adhesions and they are so bad that they are giving you a fit in life, they're making your life so miserable, let's cut you open, burn or cut whatever we can find, and close you back up again. Um, the other thing you can do, and why Dr. Sandberg Lewis was so surprised, and, uh, and the chief of staff of the hospital left the hospital and started following this was, was because we found out that there is a way to manually decrease adhesions. It feels to us like pulling apart the run in a sweater and really in, in quite slow motion because there are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of these crosslinks that have formed to create the adhesion. Um, it, it just takes a while to get through that stuff. So um, that's so that's 
where we started and, and, and let's take a few minutes to see where we started because this is and has been a fabulous adventure up until the time that Dr. SSL, Dr. Sandberg Lewis, came to consult with us and beyond, and it continues beyond. Uh, what happened was in the mid-1980s, 1984, my dear wife, uh, summa cum laude physical therapist, uh, developed cancer of the cervix um, at the bottom of her uterus. The physician said, well, well let Go ahead, let's get aggressive on this. We don't want this to, to spread anywhere. Let's do surgery, cut out everything we can. Oh, couldn't get it all. Let's do radiation therapy. We're not only going to do 40 external treatments of radiation therapy, but we're going to put you in a lead-lined room, Mrs. Wern. Um, it'll be dangerous for us to be in that room for more than five minutes at a time, but it's okay. We'll keep you drugged because we're going to keep you there for 72 hours. Um, and um, they did this twice to her. Let's take this stainless steel rod that looks like a cigar tube, put irradiated substance inside of it, put it up inside of you, right into your uterus and beside your cervix. And we're just going to have you lie there with all of your, they did not mention, all of your other organs unprotected from this radiation um, and, and just lie there for 72 hours. And then let's do it again two weeks from now. We wanted to cure the cancer. I wanted my wife back. Um, I love her dearly. Afterwards, they checked her for cancer and they checked her again and again. They had blasted this cancer with a hammer the size. <laughs> it was quite large, uh, analogously. Um, a year later, year and a half later, um, she found that she was in debilitating pain. Uh, she could not walk, move, or breathe without significant pain. I mean, debilitating. Um, she was crying all the time. Uh, she couldn't find a comfortable position. Um, we went back to the doctors and we said, "What? what is, what's going on here? Oh, oh, that's adhesions. You know, um, the, they form after, after surgery and they form after radiation therapy. It's, it's quite common. But, you know, it, where it is in her body, we, we definitely don't want to cut there. We're just going to create more adhesions. Uh, you, you're just going to have to learn to uh, live with the pain. After all, we cured your cancer. Um, that, that's, that's what we can do. We went to physician after physician after physician through Florida, through the Southeast United States. Um, we kept hearing the same thing. These are adhesions. There's nothing that can be done. Uh, if it gets really that bad, we can try to develop a surgery, but really don't recommend it because it's going to get worse. Well, I love my wife dearly, as I mentioned, and she's a brilliant woman, um, top of her class, and, and we said, we, we have to figure out what to do about adhesion. So this is, again, back in the mid-80s, so what, over 30 years ago. So we started taking a bunch of continuing education courses. First she did, and then I started joining her in physical therapy continuing education courses. Would the uh, instructors were kind enough to let me come in eventually and sit in on the classes, even though I was just a loving husband at the time, uh, because I wanted to get my wife out of pain. We took courses in lasers, microcurrents, ultrasounds, manual therapies, chiropractic things. We took every course we could imagine that might help help us understand adhesions and what we could do about them. We started getting some results. We started getting results with manual therapy courses that we took. And as we started getting some results and something started working, I would work on her and she would work on herself. When we'd get back home and we kind of developed a treatment to address her massive pelvic adhesions. They called it a frozen pelvis, the doctors did. So um, a year, we, we even went to France and took a course under some physicians there uh, where they teach urogenital manipulation and they teach how to 
treat in that that part of the body. Uh, so a year, year and a half later, she was doing well. She was out of pain virtually all the time. She was working more than 40 hours a week, doing manual therapy. Uh, she said, Larry, I, you know, I, I don't want to go back to that physical therapy that I used to do where we used hot packs and ice and ultrasound and told people to exercise. There, there are people with, with serious problems out there with adhesions like me that have no one to turn to except surgeons and as brilliant as the surgeons are, they know that the consequence of surgery is more adhesions. So she opened a small practice um, I ended up getting a massage license just to legally treat her because we couldn't find physical therapists who knew how to do the stuff that we were doing. And uh, we were treating people with, with adhesions and with pain, chronic pain patients. And this is, was most of our population and still remains a huge part of our population. Gosh, there's this place here, I just feel it. My doctor says there's nothing there. I can just feel it pulling. It, it's and that's really what it's like so often in my body. Um, what could it be? And so we would palpate, would look at their history, would say, "Well, you healed here. Let's treat that." And we did the same things with those patients that we did with Belinda, and they started getting better. And this woman, a workers' comp patient, who came to us, and she had, uh, we were treating her for pelvic pain from a fall. And um, we treated her and she came back and she said, an unusual thing happened. What's that? She said, I got, I got pregnant after you treated me. And we said, well, that's, that's great. Congratulations. She said, no, no, you don't understand. I've been infertile with totally blocked fallopian tubes for seven years. My fallopian tubes are blocked from adhesions. I've been with the same boyfriend for all that time. No, she wasn't even married. Um, the nothing has changed in my life, but you treated me there, um, treating adhesions, and now I'm going to have a baby. So um, we thought, well, that's interesting. We, we happened to mention it to a friend of ours, another physician in town. He said, did you th think you had anything to do with that? I don't know. You know, it's hard to say. Well, let me send some more patients to you. So he sent about half a dozen patients to us. Three had blocked tubes and and three did not, and f four of them, I believe, became pregnant, including uh, two with blocked fallopian tubes. Um, and we kind of went, well, that's really quite interesting. Um, but then he sends his wife, he says, you know, my wife, she's, she's 41 years old, and it's her GYN file is this thick because she's had endometriosis for so long. She's only got one fallopian tube. It's been blocked for 11 years. If you can just, she had severe endometriosis and a lot of surgeries. If you can just help her get out of pain, that'd be great. He sends her to us. She comes in one day, she says, I don't know whether to hug you or hit you. What are you talking about? She says, I'm going to be 42 years old and I'm pregnant. I mean, here she had had only one tube, massive scarring, massive adhesions, and, um, the, her tube had been blocked for 11 or 12 years. So it really got our attention. We wrote to the gynecologists in town. Most of them thought we were selling snake oil till the chief of staff of the hospital called me in and said, Mr. Warren, what is this about opening blocked fallopian tubes? Um, I handed him half a dozen charts. He said, my God, you're, he said, sir, you're doing things with your hands. I don't think I could do surgically and I'm an excellent surgeon. I said, is that okay? And he said, well, yeah, it's actually, it's great, but, but um, are, are you doing any research on this? No. He says, would you like to? And I said, sure, yeah, I'd love to. Let me tell you what the chief of staff says. This is important. This is important work. If you'd like, I will be your research director. I'd like to direct some research for you. I won't charge you. I just feel like this is important, and let's publish some studies on this. So we did, and uh, we published some studies, including opening totally blocked fallopian tubes, 69% uh, success rate 
opening tubes in, uh, in women who had not had surgery on their tubes, 61% if you included the ones that had had surgery directly on their tubes because it is the form the, from the surgery. And then about 11 years ago, and this is getting more into your realm, in your position where you may be, about 11 years ago, this rock and roll singer out west calls and she says, you know, you open those little tubes. Can you open bigger tubes? I, I read your studies. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, well, how, you know, I've had seven surgeries for adhesions and bowel obstructions. My last surgery was 12 weeks ago. They've just scheduled my eighth surgery. They're going to cut out everything that adhesions could possibly stick to, they said. I, I can only ingest liquids. My diet is severely compromised. I've lost a fifth of my body weight. Um, you, they're killing me. They're killing me. Can, can you can you help me? Because I, I have intestinal adhesions. And I said, well, I, we'd certainly we'd treat there a lot. We were treating in the pelvis at that time and wherever we would find adhesions in the soft tissues. And so she came in um, on a Monday by... Uh, Wednesday we went out and had some soft food with her but um, she went back home uh, after Friday went home canceled her surgery she has not had a, not had a surgery there in now 11 years um, and she did an in-service for her physician and his group and the nurses in the town um, so it, it really started getting our attention because we realized hey the, these intestines they're they're very important I mean giving life for women who have blocked fallopian tubes that was very gratifying but here we have people who are actually life-threatened who are going to die from their intestinal adhesions if we can't get rid of them So we started treating that population and we started doing well. As we always have tended to do, we kept data very closely and I'd like to show you some films. We'll kind of fast forward to the present. This is from a study, again, this is a patient with Crohn's who went to one of our outlying clinics. Um, as we train people, when we can find somebody good enough, we'll train her. A, physician, a physical therapist, generally it's a female. Um, we do have one other male. Um, in the, this woman, her doctor said, <clears throat> I need to schedule you for emergency surgery. <clears throat> Excuse me, you have two blocked, two blockages in your intestines. One is an hourglass shaped blockage in the upper part of your bowel. The other is a three inch long string stricture. This is a blockage. It, your intestines, dear lady, look like a coffee straw for three inches. Food is not going through there. You cannot live with this. We need to do emergency surgery on you. And she asked me what I thought and I said, well, this is what we do. If you'd like to come down, We'll be glad to treat you. And um, by the way, let's go ahead and bring those films. So she brought her films. Here is the before film of the hourglass shaped stricture. And you can see the stricture here at the, at the top where the, hour, where the arrow is showing. And then after we treated her, here is the after film. It shows as the radiologist said, excuse me, as the radiologist said, it shows a normal bowel. Um, that stricture opened and that blockage is no more. We also had this other really severe stricture, stricture again being a narrowing. There was like a three inch coffee straw in the lower part of her intestines, right near her, um, uh, her right at her terminal ileum, where, where her large intestine starts. Uh, the before picture, you can see not only 
how narrow this is, and you can imagine what kind of shape she was in and what her doctor must have thought when he saw this film and said, oh my God, nothing's going through there. And you can see, I think you'll find narrowing at the other bowel around that area, the other small intestines. And this is showing barium, showing the inside of the small intestines. After we treated her, this is the result. Again, the radiologist said, this is a normal bowel. This food can go through here. This is, this has opened up from something the size of a, of a ballpoint pin insert to, to something that's much, much larger. He said, it's a normal bowel. She canceled her surgery. She hasn't had surgery. And look at the other loops of the bowel. Compare the before to the after for the whole environment of her intestines, and you get an idea of what decreasing adhesions in the small intestine can do. So what are you left to do? Well, first you want to determine, is it reasonable that I have adhesions? Look at your history, write down your history, fill out one of our medical history questionnaires if you'd like a consult. Do I have the kind of symptoms where medications start to work and then the SIBO comes right back? That's number one. Number two, have I had surgery, endometriosis, a trauma, an infection, a burst appendix, a C-section, a tummy tuck, a bowel surgery? If so, it's reasonable to believe that I have adhesions there. Does it hurt? Does it hurt sometimes? And I tell my doctor about this place and he says, no, no, I don't see anything. There's nothing there. Let's send you to another specialist. Um, so once you pass those two things and you're pretty certain that you have adhesions, um, then what do we do about it? Well, we can either, there's nothing that, there's no medication that we can take. There's no herb, no additive, no nothing that we can take that science says can help dissolve adhesions. After all, adhesions are made of collagen. Collagen covers every single cell in the human body. It's a very challenging um, diagnosis and very challenging condition to address. Well, wait a minute, what about the stuff that you did, Larry, with this woman or that your therapist did with this woman and, and how does that work and, and should I do that or is there other body work that, that I can do? Um, so um, the work that we do, it, it's soft tissue work. Um, some people say, well, let, let's go get some visceral manipulation. Well, what we do, don't be, just to be clear, is not visceral manipulation. No, it can be effective for a lot of conditions, or I've heard that. There are few studies that I've seen on visceral manipulation where scientists actually measured results where there was an objective and sense of what we're trying to treat and then results afterwards from a biostatistician saying, yeah, 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 this is so, it's quite easy for a clinician to say, ah, oh, I bet I can treat that. Um, the, um, it's, very, it's quite light work and, and ours is not. It, the myofascial release, myo is muscle and fascia is fascia, so myofascial release was designed to treat uh, blockages in the muscles and joints of the body. It's really up to you to make the decision. Um, in our case, we have chosen to keep data so that we can show films, so that we can actually look someone in the eye and say, yeah, I think I can help you. I have data that shows I can help you. Um, or, or I can't, or this doesn't look like we're gonna be the ones to, to help you. So um, 
it's one thing to, to consider. Another thing to consider is when we first started opening blocked fallopian tubes, yes, we, we looked at the patient's history and to rule out any contraindications. We didn't want to cause any problems for that patient. We don't want to cause any problems for any patient. This is pretty deep and very specific work. Um, the difference was from those patients and our intestinal patients is the fallopian tubes are maybe four inches long and they're tiny. They don't have that much going through them every month. Of course, if they're blocked, they have nothing going through them every month. But with the intestines, we're dealing with 21 feet of small intestines, five and a half feet is a general estimate of large intestine, we are ingesting food from the outside world, some of which is clean, some of which may not be as clean as we want. There are so many processes going on in the intestines that for every person that applies for therapy, for us at least, we have 11 pages single-spaced of contraindications and things we examine. We're going to look at blood work, and we're going to look at neutrophils, white blood counts, and we're going to look at that history to determine, A, is it reasonable that we can help, and B, am I not going to injure something? Am I not going to spread a condition? And, I, and we, we just don't get injuries. I mean, we just, in over 30 years of, of therapy, we've not had a single case where a person has, has had a claim against us because we're so cautious. So do make sure if you go for some body work and it's not us, that you have your physician thoroughly vet your body and that body worker to make sure that we're, you're not going to have more problems. Okay. If you're coming to us, we're, you'll be vetted. There's, there's, we do that. We work with the physicians, but we also have the, our 11 pages of, of um, data and our protocols for, for examining every aspect we can to make sure that we're going to have a good chance to have you walk out of here with your adhesions cleared or largely cleared and with the medications working. Um, how else do we know that, that, we're, uh, that we're helping? We did publish one other study. Um, this was authored by uh, Dr. Leonard Weinstock as a co-author, um, who's a very much a luminary in the SIBO community. Another physician was a surgeon from, she was, she taught surgery at Harvard for 20 years. She's now transferred to Stanford University. Um, so, uh, Janie Pratt, they co-authored one study, the one that contains the before and after films that you saw of the bowel and the strictures opening and the bowel obstructions clearing. Uh, they also authored what is called a phase two controlled study. And this is getting to be the seal of the, like the good housekeeping seal of approval for medical studies. These are the kinds of things that will help convince your insurer that they need to be paying for this. The, where we took over a hundred patients who were having recurring bowel obstructions, because once you start having bowel obstructions and ease of bowel obstructions, they tend to happen over and over and over again because nothing's changing in there. You've got a narrowing, food's not going through. If you're following the AMA high fiber diet, they're really much more liable to obstruct. Um, and incidentally, we have a diet guide on our website for patients who have recurring bowel obstructions, it is not exactly, it's not the SIBO diet. So you have to, we'll have to determine which is the most important for you at, um, at, at, and the most urgent for you. Um, but uh, that, that may be useful for you. At any rate, we took a hundred, over 100 patients that were having recurring bowel obstructions and, that we did not treat 
which is the normal standard of care. Doctor says, you're having recurring bowel obstructions? I'm sorry, if it gets bad enough, I'll have to get in there, we'll have to cut you open and throw away what's bad. Hopefully nothing leaks out. Sew back what's left and um, there you go. And here's my card because you'll have some more adhesions and you may be back. Um, on the one side, we took those, and those are the controls. That is the present standard of care. The other side were patients that we treated who were having recurring bowel obstructions. We asked them their quality of life. The questionnaires also asked them about recurring obstructions. When the study closed 90 days later, we went back and said, how have you done? The ones that we did not treat had 15 times the number of total bowel obstructions during that 90 days than the ones that we treated. There were uh, just under 15% of them, so what, about one out of seven, had another total bowel obstruction, which total bowel obstruction means you're gonna die if something doesn't happen here. Um, in, in the ones that we treated, 0.97% or less than 1% of the patients that we treated had another total bowel obstruction during that time. Uh, there were, so that's pretty good. There were other measurements in that study and you can look up that study if you'd like. It is published in the World Journal of Gastroenterology uh, in 2018, I believe it was in May. Dr. Weinstock is one of the authors, as I mentioned, Dr. Pratt. I was one of the authors. Um, so that's your other that's your other choice, or you can just do nothing. But I do encourage you, if you are responding to medication, some, but the SIBO keeps coming right back. Talk with your physician about adhesions. Talk to him or her about what you need to do about it and when you need to do something about it. In our protocol, we're going to work with your physician so that you'll start your medications before you come in for therapy, continue them through five days of therapy, uh, two hours in the morning and two hours in the afternoon of hands-on work, um, a lot less invasive than surgery, of course, um, and then continue those medications after um, after therapy for, for a while. Depending on the medication, we will recommend a certain number of days before and after, but we're working with your physician. They, may, they are really the director of the medical part of it. We're the mechanics who decrease the adhesions so the treated bacteria can flow through. Well, I hope I've educated you on adhesions how they impact the body, how they form, why they form, and why so many experts who lecture about SIBO will talk about adhesions and how they can be a major perpetuator and major factor in SIBO. And now you have some idea of how to figure out for yourself if you may have adhesions, uh, what your options are to, to do about them if you choose to do something about them. And I thank you for your patience listening to this presentation. Goodbye.